so I think this room is too small. Shall we move to the main stage? No, 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 no. one is considered the cost of the matches. But the actually coming here would be much more. Well, first off, I want to thank everyone for being super sponsors. <coughs> it is because of you that your affirmance is able to afford this magnificent hotel. So, and we're all wonderful people. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, what does it? Uh, what is the description in the conduct of this panel? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I know the title, and that's true. But um, what's the description? Why? What? How? Why? What? Or do I just make it up? I'll make it up. Yeah, How's that? <clears throat> oh, oh, the end uh, of technology. <laughs> Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. There are times when furries, either through good intentions gone wrong or through plain short-sightedness, have taken a bad situation and made it far, far worse. I wrote this. Uncle <laughs> 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 Baggy has been around for a long time and seen it all. He will talk about some of the situations that have been created when furries tried something new and were surprised at. That's all? Added. Yes. The results. Oh. The, the <laughs> next page. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Things that furries have tried that didn't go right. <laughs> because we know why. Where do I begin? How much time do I have? And here is where here is where I must be extremely careful. I, I will try not to mention actual names of individuals or of conventions. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> so I've gotten in trouble in the past. Hmm. Furries ruin everything. All right. Imagine, imagine if you will. And this is completely an imaginary situation that never actually happened. I am making this up completely <laughs> out of my imagination. Right? Not a real world situation at all. But imagine that there would be a convention, a furry convention, a very, very prominent, well known furry convention, whose organizers. Um, decided that the convention needed to grow, and there were not enough furries to grow it. So, what if they were to advertise and promote the convention among the fetish communities? <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, this never actually happened. I'm making this up. This is what we call a hypothetical situation. Yes? Now imagine that you as a furry went to the convention and you saw interesting people in very interesting leather clothing <laughs> that was not necessarily complete clothing. <laughs> imagine if there was a gentleman in very, very highly detailed, exquisitely artistic body paint to look like a rabbit, but nothing else. <laughs> now imagine that your mother wanted pictures of the convention. <laughs> imagine how your camera accidentally fell down the stairs. <laughs> Four times until it broke. <laughs> Sorry, mother. The camera's broken. I have often said that we are our own worst enemy. Because of, because of the early days of furry fandom, the image that was put forth to the world at large was not perhaps the most positive image that could have existed. <clears throat> I've been trying to fight that ever since. Um, I, I don't know if it's the same in other languages as it is in English, but we have the saying, I take two steps forward and one step back. <clears throat> 
Sometimes I take one step forward and six steps back. <laughs> I received an email from a producer for a television show run by a former skanky, slutty model named Tyra Banks, who uh, now, because she was too old, her tits are sagging, she can't be a model anymore, now she'll have a talk show. <laughs> um, Tyra is still a model in her mind, by which I mean very, very tiny. You have to be careful talking to Tyra, because if she turns her head too far, her mind will disengage. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of those little games with the ball, where you have to try to get it into the little pit, you know? So you kind of have to smack her head to get her brain back into where it belongs. The producer sent the email, and the email contained the line, the phrase, that every email from the media has, every single email that I receive. <clears throat> we understand that furries have been treated poorly by the media, but we... <laughs> really, I don't read any further than that. I sent back a very, very polite note saying, uh, he's been a doom a comic, spike a kind of So, uh, you know, I sent back a polite note saying, you know, thank you very much for contacting me, I'm not terribly interested, neither is anybody I know interested, Anthrocon is not interested, please fuck off. And, uh, <laughs> but, what happens next? If they cannot get me to answer, they then flood the internet, all the furry sites, message boards, everything furry, they will flood with this same request. And somebody sent me an email. <gasps> Kage, here's someone from a talk show wants to interview a furry. You should do it. <laughs> I said, yeah, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, you <"The> dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, hello. So uh, I told him, I still have this email. You could call me the furry Nostradamus. I told him, here's what's going to happen. Every intelligent, rational, reasonable furry will run away screaming in fear from this person. But the producer is going to find some schlub. Do you understand the word schlub? It doesn't mean anything in English. It just sounds good. <laughs> they will find some schlub. Does it mean something in German? Yiddish. Yiddish. What's a schlub? Schmuck. Schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know also means something in German, but it's very different in English. <laughs> they will find someone who will think, oh wow, I'll be on television, I'll be famous. And that person will go on television. That person will make us sound like the most depraved, the most sick, the most mentally disturbed, twisted individuals on the face of the planet. It will cause all of us to have a very, very bad time, and that person will then be ostracized, will be kicked out of the fandom, and no one will want to talk to him again. Six weeks later, the Tyra Banks show featured a woman who goes by the name of Chu Fox. Chu Fox. Uh, who went on there with her husband and demonstrated fursuit sex and explained how they only really can reach orgasm wearing fursuits. And, and, uh, I didn't see the whole episode. I sort of fast-forwarded in you know, the fast and stopped fast, and I've seen enough. I've seen everything I need to see. <clears throat> this person immediately began to get so much hate mail on Fur Affinity that Fur Affinity servers crashed. <laughs> and we all know that's not a difficult thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, Dragon Ear, just, just teasing. <laughs> um, this might have been bad enough, but later on, she was photographed at a convention wearing a t-shirt that said, I crashed for affinity and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> I have 
to admire her for her spot. <laughs> but we still have that black eye. Because of that, this put me in an awkward situation. The next time I got an email, you know, we understand that furries have been treated badly by the <laughs> but what do I do? I'll say no. And they'll find two fox. <laughs> so I said, yes. I will be on your talk show. Now, I have some advantages that most other furries do not have. One, I'm a comic. I can, as we say, I can bat them back. <laughs> Scene two and I go back and forth. He has trained me very well. <laughs> Two, I have had professional training in dealing with the media. Because when I'm not wearing the lab coat and I'm not being a furry and I'm, I'm not being a scientist, I work in emergency services. It's very important that one does not say the wrong thing to the media in an emergency. If the wrong thing is said, you can cause a panic that could kill thousands of people, which, while entertaining, <laughs> would still be bad for one's reputation. <laughs> well, I... We understand that furries have been treated badly, but we... Yes, I will be on your show. I can't remember her name. I could look it up. It was a radio show, and I was to call in on the telephone. So when you call into the radio show, you, you first go to the control booth. The, the producer or director, I guess, in the control booth is the one who answers the phone and tells you, okay, um, gives you a quick rundown, you know, speak in short sentences, sound bites, they call them in English. Um, I, that's all right. You know, I've done this before. Don't worry. I know. Fine. And then I heard the click, and now we are live on the air. Some music played, and then I hear the, the hostess, her voice saying, and now we have on the telephone uh, from Philadelphia, Dr. Samuel Conway, who will discuss the furry fetish with us. <laughs> I was ready for that. I was expecting that. I knew it was coming. Remember, it was a surprise attack doesn't work if you know you're coming. I said, yes, indeed. Well, first off, I, I really would not characterize it as a fetish, per se. It really is simply a hobby. It's, it's sort of unfair to call it a fetish. And, you know, it's, it's really no more a fetish than, for example, uh, you know, English football is a fetish. Okay, that's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, yeah, I went on. And I kept trying to steer it in the direction I wanted to. Well, it's fandom. We call it the fandom because you know, is there adult stuff? Of course there's adult stuff. There's young people there. You know, that's what human beings do, but that's not really the center. But you've heard the speech, right? Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. My face makes noise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but she kept coming back. Well, but isn't it? It really is all about it. Well, you, you're telling me it's not about it. You can now come now. There's sex now. Of course it's sex. This is sex and that's sex. And all sex and birth suit sex and sex, sex, sex. And at one point, after she said this, again, I paused and I said, Miss, uh, you really seem to have a very unhealthy fixation with sex. Have you sought counseling? <laughs> there was a pause. <laughs> Four seconds. <laughs> which on the radio was a long time. <laughs> and she said, well, uh, thank you for that. This has been Dr. Samuel Conway. <laughs> thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Good night. <laughs> There's a saying in American furry family, you don't fuck with Uncle Cocky. <laughs> There's a reason it's why. <laughs> hey called me on my private cell phone in the middle of dinner at Anthrocon. Um, the only thing worse would have been if he'd woken me up. <coughs> There's two rules in Anthrocon. One, don't piss me off. Two, don't wake me up. <laughs> this guy got one. Real good. And 
So I had to excuse myself for a minute. This is with the guests of honor and everyone. And I said, God damn it. I went out and said, what? I said, yes, we're live on the air. And you're, you're the guy running this furry con. And they, oh, tell us all about the sex and the fursuits and everything. Ah, blah, blah, that's all about sex. And I said, well, guys, no, it's not really. Come on down. Have a look for yourselves. And, no, no, we know you people are having sex. And it's all sex. And you, you people have sex. And they're sex, 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 sex. <clears throat> so I waited for him to take a breath. I said, all right, you got me. I confess. Furries are the only ones in the world who have sex. <laughs> and you're just jealous. <laughs> Five seconds. Well, this has been Dr. Sam. <laughs> my country, simply because my country is obsessed with sex. Americans are terrified of sex. Remember, the people who first landed there were you know, Christian Puritans, who, you know, they would, they would kill someone, they would hang them by the neck if they saw a woman's ankle. <laughs> we still have that tradition today. <laughs> you notice all these, you know, bikinis on the beach there, they always have socks on. <laughs> but the problem with American furry fandom, at least, and perhaps even over here, is when that news camera is in your face and the microphone is under your nose, the first thing they say is, I'm going to defend the fandom. I'm going to save the fandom. This is my opportunity. I will be the savior. I will be the one that sets the record straight. And I will, I will make everybody understand what we are all about. So the camera starts and the microphone goes under the nose and they say, hello, what's your name? And the person says, we don't fuck animals! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that up. <laughs> it happens, it happens almost on a daily basis. So, I still fondly remember the orange-haired man. Not him. He's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> but there's a fellow who, very similar to his appearance, but, but taller and much uglier. He, uh, he happened to... Uh, encounter a, a television news crew that was preparing to go into the hotel while well, he was outside the hotel. See, inside the hotel, I can control the environment. I can make sure there's nothing in the background. I can make sure that the leather diaper wolf is not walking past. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it is true. Occasionally, when, when the news media is there, I have been known to get on the radio to security and say, Security, do you see me? Okay. That, get it out of my locker. <laughs> I was just pointing generally not to. <laughs> wolf, yes. Anyway. You're not leather diaper wolf. You're just a leather wolf. Okay. Um, so, uh, this gentleman with the orange hair was out there talking to the camera crew, and I was concerned, one, what is he going to say? Two, what will be in the background? <clears throat> so I walked around, behind the camera. Be careful what happens on camera. You don't want to make it look like, you know, you're trying to hide something. So I walked around behind the camera, and I was watching my words. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard him say, completely unsolicited, just in the middle of a sentence, he stopped and said, you know, a lot of people think that we're sexual deviants. It's actually not true. Less than 10% of us are sexual deviants. <laughs> <laughs> and with the camera still rolling, he looked and he said, uh oh, I better shut up, the chairman's looking at me funny. <laughs> Why do you drink? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I drink to dull the pain. <laughs> that actually happened. I didn't make that up either. <sighs> There's a, a photo circulating on the internet right now. A picture of me on a panel with a fursuiter. And then a picture of that same fursuiter in, in a way I would rather not have on the panel. <laughs> it's like, why? Why, God, why? Lesson to everybody. There's nothing private on the internet. Don't, you know, snap a photo just for your boyfriend or something. That doesn't work. That will never work. Once it's on the computer, the world owns it. <laughs> Trust me, there's some videos on YouTube I really wish would go away. <laughs> I was at a, not a furry convention, but a science fiction convention in Long Island in New York. A big 5,000 person convention. Okay, maybe. <laughs> but um, there were some, some young fellows, 14, 15, 16 years old perhaps, uh, outside the registration, they kept looking at me like this. Ah, recognition. These must be young furries, and they're meeting Uncle Codger for the first time. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. I see you are probably furries. And they said, "What's a furry?" <laughs> I said, "Oh, oh, uh, so you, you, you've never been to Ampricon?" I said, "What's Ampricon?" <laughs> I said, "Oh, what? I'm sorry, gentlemen. My mistake. I must have once." Wait, wait! Oh, it is him. That's the guy from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they remember that? I don't know. I didn't ask them which one they saw. <laughs> How else do furries run away? Things furries have tried. There have been, there have been some, uh, some, some conventions out there that, that really did not get very far off the ground. Um, again, we, we will not mention any names here, right? There was a... Pardon, one particular convention, many, many years ago. When a convention is started by one person, pardon, who wants to be, wants to be the man, wants to be the guy, and gets a bunch of volunteers to help them out, that's dangerous. You know, a convention really needs to be the combined effort of a group of people with a common goal in mind. When you have one person who is absolutely in charge, calling all the shots and just giving orders to everybody else, things don't work. You Germans would have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, that was a road shot. Your old friends now remember that. Anyway, but it still happens. You know, we could use those events of that many years ago as a lesson, but people do not learn this lesson. This fellow started his convention and well, immediately I could see there was a problem, because, well, many of you, of course, work for a manager, or perhaps you're a manager yourself. There is always a boss, correct? Have you ever worked for a boss who felt that any time something worked well, it was me! Any time something does not work well, him! <laughs> Don't blame me, the people who worked for me failed in their job. But when these people did a fantastic job, yes, do you notice how my department came through? I saw that immediately in this guy. Uh, there's a, there's a, an, an English word for that, which is a dickhead. <laughs> he thought nothing of yelling at some of the volunteers for in his eyes, doing a bad job, in front of the attendees, and that immediately turned me off. Things definitely, as we say, went south <laughs> at the, the feedback session when I asked a question about their finances. Yeah. Um, most conventions are, are not designed to be profitable. It's a non-profit organization. All of the money that goes in to the convention 
is now the money that makes next year's convention happen. No one is supposed to be taking any into the pocket. I know often my pockets are empty after the convention. <laughs> uh, this gentleman said, oh, no, no, this, this is a, a for-profit enterprise. Yeah, this is a business that, that is in, in, in business for profit. Yeah. Essentially, any extra money I will do. I was sitting with a bunch of his volunteers, <laughs> his unpaid labor, who all had the same expression on their face. <laughs> After the convention, uh, all of his volunteers ganged up on him, <laughs> took him into a room and said, now you listen here. We're the people who make this convention work. You work for us. And they laid down the law. They said, here is what the chairman does. Here is your responsibility. Here is what we will do. Let's make next year's convention better than this year's. Wonderful crew. That's exactly what they should do. Well, this fellow uh, got butt hurt over this. <laughs> but was his butt hurt in Deutsch? <laughs> so, uh, uh, what he did was he simply quit without telling anyone. He did not perform any of his duties. He did not get a hotel contract. He did not arrange for a hotel rate. He did not make any arrangements for the convention at all. He simply did not do anything. While everyone else was continuing to prepare for what they thought would be a convention. <clears throat> I also know this mindset of people. I've had managers like this myself. About two months before the convention, I got a frantic telephone call from their second in command saying, Oh my God! And he told me, what had happened? He said, we don't have a hotel contract. What are we supposed to do? I said, well, I happen to know that the hotel doesn't have a contract. Why don't you call them and make one? He said, great idea! <laughs> People are like, oh, Uncle Kage knows all these things. <laughs> I'm glad I'm so brilliant. I, I just... Thought of that off the, <laughs> but you know, panic, terror, fear. It, it, okay, he didn't. Okay, so they simply got their hotel contract. They they caught the ball as it was falling, and they they had the convention without him. And after the convention, he started a campaign by which he was describing the uh, the 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 plotting that was that was suitable for Machiavelli in taking his convention away from him. <laughs> and there was a lot of drama for a while until I decided it was time that I spoke up. I realized then I've got a very loud voice <laughs> because I simply accused him in public of doing everything I just described. <laughs> and he disappeared. <laughs> I like it when they disappear. <laughs> Some of you who were at the last Super Sponsor event might have heard this story. Some of you were quite properly watching To the Ranting Griffin, and you should have been. I don't know why you people were looking at me making face noise, too. It does it much better than I do. <laughs> but this is also a prime example of how furries ruin everything. We are our own worst enemy. There was a television camera crew from a national network at Anthrocon that wanted to interview our guest of honor several years ago. Hi, you were there. <laughs> so what this person wanted to do is this person wanted to have fursuiters in a line behind the interview. So the interviewer would be discussing with the, the guest of honor, and there'd be a background of fursuiters. By simple blind coincidence, 
all of the finest fursuiters in the fandom happened to be <laughs> hanging out in the lobby that morning. Just by chance. <laughs> so, they were all lined up. There was a representative, I think, of all the major fursuit makers, representatives of many countries. Chan. <clears throat> lined up there, and they're all nicely lined up. And the interviewer was going, yes, I'm an interviewer, yes, I am the guest of honor, yes, uh, blah, 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 and there's more blah, yes, of course, blah, and yes, yes, I like the blah, and yes, the blah is very nice, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, uh, and I was standing behind the camera. <laughs> this is wonderful, this is wonderful. The camera was rolling, and a gentleman in a husky suit walked up behind one of the first suitors in the background and started doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and behind the camera was like, ah, ah, ah. Oh, God, no. <laughs> These fingers are artificial. I bit them off. <laughs> <laughs> They're made of plastic. <laughs> what can you do? It's on camera. You can't run in and break it up. That draws attention. So I, I kind of crouched down behind the first first group of me and was sneaking, trying to stay out of the shot. Hey! 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 Bam! <laughs> when he went down, I grabbed him, pulled him out, threw him at security, and said, Get him out of here! <laughs> I've never seen him since. <laughs> I don't know what they did. I don't want to know what they did. But behind my convention center, there's a big, deep river. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> nothing. I don't know nothing. There's no fence there either. Sorry? There's no fence there either. I know there's not. Which is why I don't like first just walking down by the river. Please don't do that. Anyway. <laughs> well, yes, it's, it's, it's concrete walk water. <laughs> what happened on TV then? Mm. What happened on TV? Later that evening, the broadcast was at 6 o'clock, 1800. I was up in my room. The, my, my fine German friends were up there, Night Fox and Tommy, and were holding on to my hand, in which I was holding a 38 caliber pistol. <laughs> Tommy had her finger behind the trigger, so I couldn't. <laughs> Big Blue Fox was sitting there with American beer. He loves American beer. He had drunk maybe four cases of it, which is the equivalent of maybe three. German beers? <laughs> but he was, he was, he was, big blue, I am big blue fox, and I'm happy. <coughs> but these people are holding me in my chair, trying to keep me from killing myself. <coughs> and the broadcast came on. Now we go to downtown Pittsburgh, the convention center, with your interviewer and guest of honor at Anthrocon. <laughs> because this would destroy us. Everything I have worked for, everything I have tried to build in the city of Pittsburgh was about to come crashing down like a sandcastle before the waves. Here was the line of first suitors. Here we see the interviewer, blah, blah, yes, blah, 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 going back and forth, and we see the husky <laughs> come in. While the interview audio still ran, the video cut to a panoramic view of the dealer's room. <laughs> and then cut back just in time to see the husky going free! <laughs> 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 this goes very well with the convention war stories panel because many of them are the same. Uh, I have a question. Yes, yes, yes. And um, most of those problems seem to be caused by severe stupidity. Have you ever seen anyone deliberately trying to sabotage the career? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. Um, and you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. And here's why. Because it will gratify the person. I see. It will give him what he wants. And as far as I'm concerned, he is a piece of dirt. He has nothing to worry about. People have tried to sabotage the family. People have deliberately tried to give us a black eye, as we say. But you know what? We're still here. Mm -hmm. So fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but I could tell you. Later on. No cameras, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> um, <coughs> there was one fellow who, uh, uh, 
actually tried to find him. This was Anthrocon 2008 and 2009. There was a mass email that was sent to all of the Pittsburgh television stations, to all of our hotels, <clears throat> to all of our guests of honor, saying, beware, this Samuel Conway is a child molester. <laughs> you know, and he runs this convention of child molesters. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is going to be an interesting afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I started getting these reports from people, but the gentleman was not very smart because he said, here is evidence. Would you, would you stand up, please? What do you mean? Yes. <clears throat> Here is evidence that this Uncle Kage guy is a child molester. Here's a photo taken at a convention. That person is 16 years old. See? <laughs> <laughs> so, people asked me, they sent me, said, what's this all about? And I said, I looked at the photo and I said, it makes me look fat. <laughs> <laughs> but drop me an email when he's able to get some real photos, okay? In other words, <coughs> it was very easy to dismiss it. Uh, he tried again next year, the following year, but by then, everyone was like, oh, him again. <laughs> <laughs> um, we always had cranks. That's another great English word, a crank. Doesn't really mean much, you know, an insane person. <clears throat> we'll come up and try these things. Insane people. That's a good segue. <laughs> All you old folks. How many people can remember back as far as Eurofer and Seven? Wow. <clears throat> Do you remember the name Bot Vervoe, a.k.a. Nekobe? <laughs> Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm, a famous furry. Yes. For those of you who do not know what we're talking about, Mr. Bouvet was uh, a gentleman from Belgium. He oh. was Belch, you see. Ah, yes, the Belgian, that one. The, the Belgian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you notice, half the people got it when I said the Belgian. <laughs> no, I'm from Belgium, that's why. <laughs> oh my God. He is one of your countrymen. Um, I was not aware of him until uh, it was Anthrocon in 1999. He arrived at our convention. He seemed, at first glance, to be a reasonable, rational Belgian, if that's not an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> I joke, I joke. <laughs> um, but it immediately became apparent that this was going to be a problem, demanding sex from him. Not asking, but demanding. And when the first suitors Decline. He started shouting and screaming that he had friends in the Russian Mafia that was going to come and kill them. Well, naturally, my security was getting a lot of phone calls. Uh, there was a gentleman there who was a friend of mine, came to me and told me this story, that he had gone to his room with a, uh, a, a fursuiter friend. And this gentleman happened to be walking with them. They thought he was also going to his room, but when they got to their room, he started to walk inside. And he turned and stopped him and said, uh, excuse me, this is our room. And this Monsieur Vallois said, and I quote, will there be any jiffing going on in there? <laughs> and they said, that's our business. Uh, why don't you go to your room now? And this fellow again started screaming about the Russian Mafia and how he was going to, you know. And the fellow said, that's really very nice. We're going to go into our room now. And this Mr. Bodoway attempted to become physical with him. It's not a good idea. This gentleman is a United States Navy SEAL. <laughs> <laughs> Tied Mr. Pivoway into a wetsuit. 
Depositing him in the laundry chute of the hotel and sent him to the basement. And about an hour later, he was brought to me. And I started to tell him, you are, you are causing me trouble. Do not cause me trouble. This is not a good place to cause me trouble. Hello. Hello. Finland has arrived. So, uh, you're late. I know, I was joking when I said that about this being in a separate time zone. You should not listen to me. It's <laughs> <laughs> not about furries ruining everything. Yes. Uh, I ruined your con uh, concentration. Sit, 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 sit. <laughs> but don't tell him how the story started. <laughs> <laughs> well, this gentleman was brought to me, and as soon as I started grading, he started complaining loudly to me about people who were attacking him in the hallways. Everywhere he went in the hallways, people were punching him and kicking him. And I said, uh, that's a terrible thing. Um, may I point out you don't appear to have any bruises? There's no blood on you anywhere? Well, he was very insistent. So I dismissed his claim. I said, look, listen, don't give me that. You know, I'm sorry that you're crazy, but that's not my problem. <laughs> I was informed that there are gentlemen in the room, and he said, that room has, has, has pornography in it. I said, yes, it's a furry convention. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, they are, they, are, they are having drugs in that room. I said, look, this is, this is not part of the conversation. That room has drugs in it! And I say, listen, that is not my concern. That's a matter for the police. Wrong thing to say. Uh, Ten minutes later, the police arrived. <laughs> oh. I was not there, but as I understood later from being told, it went very much like that. And the gentleman opened the door find three police officers who said, may we come in? And they said, yes. We've had reports there are drugs in this room. Um, no officer, there are no drugs in here. Thank you. Is it all right if we investigate the room? Please, officer, do. What's that? That's a fursuit officer. <laughs> What's it for? <laughs> Put it on and pretend to be a raccoon. <laughs> but there's no drugs in it. <laughs> no officer, no drugs at all. <laughs> Thank you, we're going. <laughs> and they found Mr. Boudoua and they said, no drugs. Raccoon suit, no drugs. <laughs> and he said, they must have thrown it out the window. I demand you search the grounds. And the officer said, we really have to go someplace right now. We'll search the grounds later. <laughs> We're just going to go now. <laughs> so, um, after the convention, Mr. Boudoua received a letter from me. That letter. The one that says, thank you, don't come again. <laughs> he sent me an email saying, how can you support child pornography? <laughs> what? He then emailed me what he claimed was examples of the child pornography that had been in that room. I'm like, delete, 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 delete. <clears throat> block, delete, IP block, kill everything. I did not hear again from him. Then I received the invitation from Chita. Would you like to be guest of honor at Euroferns 8? Absolutely, yes, I would like to be. But why me? He said, we want you to get drunk and fall down. <laughs> I'm a man. Yes. I'm qualified. So, Chita and I met. He was very young. I'll never forget, he looked like a 12-year-old. <laughs> of course, I was younger, too. But, and we started sharing stories. And I said, I got one for you. This guy named Nicobe and Chita went, oh, God. 
<laughs> I said, oh, you know him. He said, yeah, he's one of us. <laughs> Apparently, Mr. Bilbaway had done that same sort of thing at Euro Furnace. Uh, that year, oh, now my memory is starting to fail me. I believe it was that same year. <clears throat> Mr. Bilbaway had, uh, had made telephone calls to the youth hall. So this was when they were in Oberbaum House, I believe. EFE, yes. He had made telephone calls to that youth hostel, uh, claiming that he was going to arrive with a shotgun and a tank and, and rocket launchers, and he was going to destroy the place and kill everybody in it. Of course, the owner of the hostel said to Chita, <laughs> So Chita said, nah, he's coming. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as I understand, I uh, was told by Chita later that the owner of the hostel was the brother of the owner of the psychiatric hospital. <laughs> and he said, let me call my brother. <laughs> Mr. Bivouac did not arrive. There were no shotguns. There were no rocket launchers. There were no murders. There were cows. There were cows. There were cows. You see, the youth hostel was located next to a farm. And there was a fence and a gate separating the farm from the youth hostel. And one morning I woke up, I'd had my breakfast, and I was sitting, I think I was the only American there that year, it was kind of interesting. And a security person went running by. Now, it's the con chairman's instinct, I have my button that says, not my fault, not my problem, not my con. It's the con chairman's instinct, when security is running, get up and run behind them, what's, what, what, what? And he turned around and he said, cows! He said, cows. <laughs> she said, cows, cows, moo, moo, moo! I said, what? And a cow went, moo! He said, now the cows! I said, you know, I've never had this problem. <laughs> Apparently, one of the furries had opened the gate. And the cows had come in and were running all around to the con space. <laughs> That's when I developed my phrase, my mantra. Not my fault, not my problem. <laughs> okay. Oh, you almost got that one. <laughs> ah, riding cowboy. <laughs> How did it solve it? They rounded up all the cows. I mean, these, these they, they were they were like Texas cowboys. They did fantastic. They round them all up. They shooed them back into the farmer's pasture. An hour later, they found the one leftover cow. Everyone thought it was a fursuit. They had to <laughs> the devour. The farmer was not happy. Now, they did not return to Oberbaumhatz, and I think that was perhaps why. But we all know what happened to the F9. No. No. The F9. There were some complaints, mostly from the French, that <laughs> Eurofrance is supposed to be in a different European nation every year. That was the charter, that's how it started. Why is it always in Germany? <clears throat> so the Germans said, All right, who wants it? <laughs> but then at the back of the room, a little hand went up from the Czech Republic. <laughs> <laughs> so Chita said, Czech Republic. And all the Germans said, Nein! <laughs> I nicht Czech I was on the message boards. I couldn't understand it, it was just bang, bang, bang! Nine, nine, he's not, no, nine, nine! <laughs> they are not going, they will not go, they refuse to go! My goodness, I said, why not? Why won't you go? They do not want to go into the Czech Republic! I said, you had no problem in 1939. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it stopped the conversation cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody answered me. And when I went to Euroference 9, I learned why they didn't want to go. <laughs> I was picked up in a vintage Soviet era Skoda at Praha, uh, at and they drove me through to Samopshe, 
in the Czech Republic, these little tiny country roads that were as wide as this table. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we kept driving by people who kept looking at us like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I commented to the driver. I said, you would think they'd never seen a car before. He said, they probably haven't. <laughs> <laughs> at the con site, and, well, it was described as a youth camp. Camp was correct. <laughs> it had these very, very square, gray, concrete bunkers <laughs> with small rooms where you could see there had been bars on the windows. The doors had two locks, one on the inside, one on the outside. <laughs> this was a Stalin-era youth camp. <laughs> a youth camp that Uncle Joe built. <clears throat> Behind it was the beautiful river. I cannot remember the Czech name for the river, but they just called it the Toxic River. <laughs> Would you stand up just a moment, could you please? Yes. Did you see the color of this gentleman's jumper? That was the color of the river. Exact <laughs> color. Um, they, they said that it was algae. And uh, I've seen algae. Uh, they did an incredible job. Now, I for one moment am not going to say that the Czech firms did a poor job. They did a phenomenal job with the resources they had on hand. Check. Resources. <laughs> they hired a contractor to erect a tent, a big circus tent. We will have our main stage events at the tent. Why not? It'll be fun. It'll be like a big circus. This will be wonderful. They put the tent up. <clears throat> um, apparently, the electrician who wired in all of the electricity was unfamiliar with the concept of grounding. <laughs> I was on stage, making face noises and being happy and drunk, and, uh, what, more than one? <laughs> Let's talk about it now. <laughs> oh, that, so I was making face noises, and behind me was the pulpit stage, and I heard Fairlight, Kage, Kage. What's going on? He said, don't touch the light bulb, it's under current. Yeah. I said, well, of course it's under current, or else there'd be no lights. I thought, I'll be funny. You mean this uh, light bulb? He said, no, no, no! <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Cheetah had touched the light bulb, and it had been knocked four meters back. <laughs> the light poles, the tent poles, the tent itself was electrified. <laughs> All the current was running through Everything around us. They had to put security people, you remember that, they had to put security people around all of the poles to prevent anyone from touching it and being killed by the electricity. I continued my show as it began to rain. I just kept drinking, which was not a problem. Uh, at the time, the Czech Republic was using, uh, I believe it was the forint. Was the, uh, was it, uh... No. No? Corrie. What? Corrie. The, that, those things. The Czech currency, which I cannot say with my American tongue, I apologize. Um, a, uh, a, a glass of wine cost 20, which at the time was about 60 American cents. <laughs> it cost 20 for a full glass of very, very fine, excellent Moravian wine. I had 1,500 in my pocket. <laughs> so I didn't care it was raining. <laughs> they had a problem with the microphones. Oh. You see, the microphones were wireless. It sounded like a radio station that was poorly tuned in from 60 kilometers away. <laughs> Scratchy, you heard maybe a voice in the back with all the crackle and the lightning. Unusable, utterly unusable. And Cheetah 
came to me, he said, he said, they're going to have to cancel the pulpit show. I said, no! Actually, it was more like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much go on. <laughs> he said, what are we going to do? I said, figure it out, you're German. <laughs> and they did. These are the most resourceful people on the face of the earth. They, they had the pulpit show was on the stage on the front. The control stage was back here. They took microphones with wires and they literally ran them through the audience over people's shoulders to the stage. And that's the people sat in the audience with wires on their shoulders. And during the intermission, I was asked to do silly things up there, which I did. But you know that when I'm on stage, I, I tend to go back and forth like this a lot. And it was great, I saw the whole audience doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so I just did more. <laughs> I got a wave going, yeah! <laughs> so that was not furries ruining everything, that was furries rescuing everything. They still refer to EF9 as the disaster. I call it the triumph because they showed just how creative and resourceful furries can be when they put their minds to it. I was proud of them. Of course, going home, the gentleman in the Skoda told me we have to leave an hour earlier. Why? Has my flight been changed? He said, no, it's uphill. <laughs> I said, that's not a problem. He said, maybe I should show you the engine. So I went around to the front of the car and I lifted the... There was no engine in there. <laughs> no, it's in the back. Oh, I opened the back. The engine was about this big. <laughs> it, was, it, looked, it looked like a lawnmower engine. Just a little tiny thing, thing with little, little hamsters. <laughs> And he did, it took an extra hour. <laughs> we get to the top of the hill, like a roller coaster. <laughs> but I still love it. I still think EF9 is one of my favorite Euro runs. Because I didn't have to run it. I'm like, no, I'm How much time do I have for this? Half an hour? Half an hour? What? What was it? Does it go one and one half or one hour? I'll keep going. Well, I would keep going. But, you know, I suddenly am feeling extremely depressed. <laughs> Looking at my class, which is empty and meaningless, like my life. Murder talk, I'll have talking bitte. <laughs> I know I'm a slut. It's terrible. <laughs> I did this. I did this at uh, at at, um, uh, at Confuzzle. There was a British fur. I might have been new, in fact. He came by and and you. He said, "Kaki, what are you doing?" And I said, "Nothing." <laughs> then he said, "What's wrong?" I said, "Oh." <laughs> it just. I can't face it. <laughs> so he kindly went and filled it up for me. And there was a chap sitting at the next table. When he brought me the wine, the chap said, Two minutes, 40 seconds, that's amazing. <laughs> but you know, there are some furries out there who cannot handle their alcohol. I know, this is Germany, that's sacrilege. You say that. Furries ruin everything. The staff is not allowed to talk about it. I can't. There are some, some tweets going around. There are some reports from people saying, I got banned from neurofurids because I had alcohol in my room. No, you got banned because you had alcohol in you. <laughs> they're, I, they're making up all sorts of stories. Trust me, the last thing a convention chairman wants to do is ban someone. It makes us feel bad. It's bad press. 
It's bad for public relations. It's bad for everyone. We only ban people when we are forced to. Chita will not show you because he's professional. He showed me because I'm not professional. <laughs> <laughs> Why were these gentlemen banned? Chita showed me the pictures of the pools of blood on the floor that these gentlemen had caused to another attendee while they had been drinking. <clears throat> now, this is a serious matter. It takes a lot of work to clean that blood up. <laughs> and the hotel had to expend a lot of energy to get that blood out of the carpet. <clears throat> so Chita had to tell these fellas, don't come back. But of course, what's the first thing somebody does when they're banned from a convention? I was banned for no reason at all. Oh, yeah, right. Uncle Kage woke up with a headache and thought, oh, I'll ban someone today. How about you? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that. There are some people I should have banned that I didn't. This one young lady out there can actually be thankful to my dear sister. My sister attends Anthrocon. Um, I was in my art show. Not really seeing the art I was looking at the art, but I was not seeing it. I was seeing the face of the convention center's manager doing this to me. <laughs> Walking, looking at the art, and all I saw was... <clears throat> and we have a big sign that says... Ah! <laughs> 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 Created by a Dr. Müller in Torgau, Switzerland. Very, very commonly grown in Eastern Germany. Mm. Comes in a dry and half-dry variety. Sucks that I know all this. <laughs> mm, no, no, no. Anyway. I have my little androgyny, incredulous thing here. I was in the art show. And, of course, there's signs everywhere saying, do not photograph the art. This is not rocket surgery. I do not photograph the art. I came around the corner of one of the art show days, and I saw a young lady with her android go right up to a piece of artwork and take a picture. This far away from me. I said, give me that! I took it to the front, I put it down, I said, when she comes for a take her badge. And I went back into the art show, and I couldn't enjoy anything. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes later, my sister came out. My sister has always had a calming influence on me. When I was a small boy, and I would be upset, I'd be crying, I'd be mad, throwing a tantrum, my sister would come up to me and across the face, and oh, immediately I'd be calm. <laughs> so she did that, and um, she said, there's a very... Sorry, young lady out front would like to talk to you. So I went out front and I said, Yeah, yeah, you cannot, no, bad, bad, I will growl at you, I am evil, yes. <laughs> Gave her the phone back and made her, he's not here, to see if she wanted me to bid on it. I said, oh good, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I'll let you back in, it's just because that's a new one. But I'll tell you what. Why don't you go down to, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue down there, take the most expensive dress and walk out front with it. And when they stop you, say, oh, I just wanted to take it home and try it on and see if I want to buy it. Fucking <laughs> <Bucket> furries. <laughs> I can say that. Well, we have had our share of uh, people at Anthrocon who cannot hold their alcohol. Usually they are people who are of the age of, oh, 15 or 16, who show up and they start drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. This always causes a problem for me. Because what do you do? If I, if I get angry and punish them, then the next time the friends of that person will say, we can't let Uncle Kage know, and then that person will die choking on his own vomit which is hard to get out of the rug. 
<coughs> what, 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 what other instances where, where <laughs> furries, just being furries, have that? Uh, oh, sure. Oh. What? Who are you people? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I had actually managed to block that from my memory successfully for my own personal sanity, and he's just brought it back. <laughs> there was a wonderful lady and author who was writing a book, a book on fan organizations. She wanted to get into the mind of, okay, all fans are alike. Whether you're a sports fan, a, a trading card fan, a furry fan, a Star Trek fan. What motivates these people? She went to a trading card convention, she went to a Star Trek convention, she wanted to go to a furry convention. Pardon. To my everlasting dismay, I told her no, because I did not trust her. So she went to the one convention I wish she had not. <laughs> She was introduced to a gentleman. Now, this book is called Who Are You People? You can pick it up. It's available on Amazon. It's actually a very good book. Very well researched, very well thought out. I, I actually really should apologize to the lady for being so brusque and turning her down. I, I was out of line. I did not realize she was so scholarly. Oh, she sees this. But she was told, oh, you need to talk to this guy over here. He's a pop you for you know, whatever. So she started talking to him. Now, the first page, as she went through their discussion, could have been Uncle Kagi, could have been To the Rank of Griffin, could have been KP, it was, it was good stuff. You know, this first animal, anthropomorphics, you know, ancient, you know, human beings, we've always, animals, and yes, they're cave paintings, everything. <clears throat> then we go to the top of the next page. Suddenly, without warning, he said, you know, I have four partners. It went down from there. As he started to go into detail about his sexual tetragon that he had with his various friends. Friends. Thank you. He's <laughs> looking for the right word there. And I, I, I was reading this, I, I could not tear my eyes away and think, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. This woman was so disturbed, so upset, so distressed by this, she had to break off the conversation and leave. And she started, you know, describing, I, here I thought that this was the worst, you know, most depraved, awful, terrible, filthy, devil, satanic, ew. She needed to get a cup of coffee just because she needed something. <clears throat> in the coffee shop, she happened to see a young lady who had a black sketchbook was drawing in the sketchbook some furry things. The young lady goes by the name of Christian Jaguar in our family, who is probably the best person she could have spoken to, <laughs> because the interviewer decided to try a second time and sat down, and when she mentioned the name of the first person, Christian said, Oh, him. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then gave her the other side of the coin. And it saved it. It rescued the chapter. I am so, so grateful to Christian for doing that. And I still want to get my hands on the other guy. <laughs> because the furries ruin everything. <laughs> with the wrong word, with the wrong gesture, by just having the wrong t-shirt on. You know, if, if you're up there talking to a person about, yes, yes, you know, furries absolutely love children. We love to go up and hug children. You've got a shirt that says, got yif. <laughs> oh. <laughs> happened. Yes, <laughs> happened. <laughs> oh. My oh. brace. <laughs> But you know what? We were looking out earlier, out at the street where I was having uh, lunch with my dear parents over here. There were some fursuiters were playing with some little kids out there. And they were bouncing around. The kids were having fun. The parents were taking pictures. The fursuiters were having a good time. Everybody was having a good time. Where's the media then? Where are they then? You know, they only seem to show up 
when, you know, you get the guy in the Jaguar fursuit who's just ingested four liters of beer in 60 seconds, <laughs> and he's out there puking through the Jaguar. <laughs> there's the news media. There's, a, there's RTL2. Thank you. You're right there. <laughs> Who do they find? Who do they find? They'll walk in. RTL2 walks in right now. They'll walk in and see all these wonderful, upstanding, respectable, beloved people. Who do they find? Uncle Frank. <laughs> Let me explain Uncle Frank. <laughs> Has anyone ever gone to a family reunion? A reunion of the extended family? Yes? You know, when you go to the family reunion, at every reunion of the family, every family has Uncle Frank. He's, he's the man who sits over there all by himself. Nobody talks to him, and the parents don't let the children go anywhere near. You have to invite him because he's a member of the family, but you really wish he wouldn't be there. <laughs> The media comes in, and they have this little GPS that can locate Uncle Frank. <laughs> Uncle Frank can be inside a box under a blanket locked in Connaughts, and they will break into the room. Oh, there you are. May we interview you? <laughs> Uncle Frank is the one who drools on himself when he talks about wolves. Yes, I like wolves. <laughs> I recall an incident at an unnamed convention where a gentleman came up to me and asked the eternal question, what is all this? I run an entire panel on answering the question, what is all this? <laughs> what is all this, he said. And I started explaining, you know, anthropomorphic, uh, fur, and, you know, cartoon, and, uh, blah, 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 blah. and this very badly made up she -mail with makeup that had been applied with a gardening trial. <laughs> <laughs> Came bouncing up and said, Ah, yes, we feel so free to be ourselves at this convention. <laughs> now, there's an artist by the name of Jim Grote had been walking by. He saw this. He grabbed the reporter and turned to him and said, Yes, and I am a comic book artist. I make my living doing this here. And yes, I will show you some of the comic art. And the female came around behind Jim. And I grabbed him and I said, And I am a scientist. And, I, and we just kept back in the pool. <laughs> By the end of the interview, he was like, thank, thank you, gentlemen, I should <laughs> I have to be so careful telling that story. I told that story on stage, an Uncle Kage story hour at a convention in 2003. And I started to go into more detail. I said, this was the most repulsive, disgusting freak of nature, this hermaphroditic horror, this absolutely loathsome, repulsive thing that... And in the front row was an absolutely stunning, beautiful, gorgeous blonde who said, Watch it, buddy. <laughs> For the first time in my career, I was speechless. I was like... <laughs> I wound up apologizing to her, I suppose, afterward, and can I at least buy you a drink? And the individual said, that's all right, thank you. <laughs> Bye, I gotta go. <laughs> so I'm very careful telling that story. <laughs> hmm. The only thing better would be if it was a lovely Riesling from the Mosul Valley, which we really need here. The, the, the Mosul Valley in Germany has been a wine brewing region since the days of the Romans, so it's very appropriate. I told Chief, you should have several cases of that here, <laughs> because it's, it's appropriate to the theme. But he forgot. <laughs>
The story that I told about the guy who was writing the letters saying I was a, a child molester, yeah. I have a strong suspicion that it was a gentleman who was attempting to start a convention in another state yeah. and was not having any success. <laughs> Again, I don't want to gratify him, but yeah, I know who you are, you fuck. Exactly <laughs> <laughs> who you are, and you know where you live. <laughs> but you don't fuck with Uncle Kai. <laughs> yes? I would like to know the radio show you mentioned at the starting. Is there a record of this? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, would, I would have to remember. I could look back in my emails and get the lady's name, and then we could probably see if there's a recording of it. Um, I, I have a recording of the, the Irish radio, there's an Irish radio show that I did, where they were trying to get me to say the word yes, <laughs> and I, I was dancing with them. I could see them trying to lead me, and I'd kind of go in that direction, then jump over it. <laughs> that was fun, that was a dance. <laughs> there was a gentleman um, who learned why they say you don't fuck with Uncle Kyle. <laughs> Because, see, when I was young, I had to deal with bullies in school, people who tried to beat me up. My way of dealing with them was massive retaliation. <laughs> you, know? you know? Hit him in the head with a board with nails sticking out of it, and he makes a face at you. That's the sort of thing that keeps the bullies away. <laughs> she talked about <laughs> She's the one that taught me to put a little roll of quarters in my hand if I'm going to punch someone. <laughs> but buy her a drink later, she'll tell you more. <laughs> there was a gentleman many years ago at Anthrocon who, he wanted to be a filmmaker. And he thought he would make a jackass-style video. He was going to try to create havoc at Anthrocon and have security running around trying to find out what's wrong, and he would film it, and it would look like, you know, the old Keystone Cops or something, and it would be a comedy that he would then produce. I found out about this in advance. This gentleman was a student at a local university, and he made the mistake of making all of his plans with his friends on a private message board that was not password protected. <laughs> so I simply got onto the message board and said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very easy when you start searching for names on the internet to correlate them to actual people and pictures. I found out he was a student at a local university. So I called up the president of the university. I said, hello, my name is Dr. Conn. <laughs> I'm holding a conference in a few weeks, and it seems one of your students intends to disrupt it. What sort of student are you producing there? Do you condone this behavior? Have you no standards of conduct for your students to follow? We had a long discussion, he and I, and uh, we came to the agreement that I then sent him a, a letter in writing. The agreement was, this could simply be, you know, a student who is just talking, right? And then nothing will come of it. But, if anything were to happen, I would contact the university president right away. And I took a copy of that letter, and I put it over here. <laughs> then I contacted the local police. And I said, hi, I'm the guy who brings all that money to your city. <laughs> There's a guy out there trying to stop it. And the police said, what's his name? What's he look like? I said, you know, I happen to have pictures. <laughs> um, I sent all those to them and made copies. And I kept following their plans. Their plan was they were going to stage a fake fist fight, and then they were going to run away when security responded, and then 
they film. What's, where's the fight? The fight. Oh, no, it's in the parking garage. They're fighting in the parking garage. And they go to the parking garage. No, no, it's in the lobby. They go to the lobby. So um, I thought, okay, this is all interesting. Then, then, they made a big mistake. They said, we'll shut down the elevator. <laughs> now it's personal. <laughs> Two of these people were actually coming in from South Africa. They had formerly been students in the university, friends of his. They now lived in South Africa. They were going to be coming in from South Africa to help him in his little <coughs> trip. I called up the American Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> I said, I have reason to believe that foreign nationals will be coming through Philadelphia Airport in order to sabotage elevators in a high-rise hotel. <laughs> I sent them a letter to that effect. And the letter said, I do not have their names, but when they arrive, I will call you. And I got that letter over here. <laughs> Every single one of these people had a little package waiting when they picked up their badges at registration. <laughs> with the letters and the pictures and the letter back from Homeland Security. <laughs> Strangely enough, nothing happened. <laughs> The ring leader, the gentleman in charge, he was an artist. He was going to be in our artist alley. He was in the, the queue to get into the artist alley. And I saw him, and my security said, do you want us to do it? And he said, no. This is too much fun. <laughs> I just like watching him. But then I got a phone call. Police are here. So I went up to the lobby. The Philadelphia police, this was in Philadelphia at the time, had sent two of the biggest, blackest, most gigantic police officers. <laughs> Each one was six meters tall. <laughs> they kind of crawled in through the front, put their backs on the ceiling. And they said, Are you Conway? <laughs> Is he here? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> Let me show you him. <laughs> I said, has he done anything? I said, not yet. <laughs> but maybe you just want to get a look at him just to see what he looks like. <laughs> so I took them downstairs. They took the stairs just once, just like this. <laughs> Their, their hats brushing against the ceiling, which was like the ceiling in the lobby out here. <laughs> we walked over, and this, I got to see him. I got to hear his face down in the sketchbook as these two big shadows. <laughs> and he looked up at these two police officers. <laughs> and I got to see his face when he looked at me and saw me going, <laughs> <laughs> No trouble that year. <laughs> <laughs> to answer the question, people have attempted to sabotage Anthracon. They're welcome to try. <laughs> because it's fun. <laughs> you might have heard of this group, Anonymous, mm -hmm. they call themselves. They were going to protest Anthracon. And it's because, oh, they're, oh, they're going to protest us. And I said, well, they're allowed to. This is, this is a free country. Well, their, um, their thing that they do is, is they wear these, these large wigs that look like Afro wigs. Yeah. And their, their, their logo is a man named Negro Jim, a black man. And they pretend to be like black people. I, I, this is what they do. <clears throat> I contacted the, the local, you know, various black legions, black panthers, everything I could find, and said, these people apparently don't want black people in our city. <laughs> Go ahead and try, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> but it, I 
five, six, nine. Any questions? Things you might have heard about, you want to know if they're true? They probably are. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Mm. Not concerning the stories, but I've got a question about your, co uh, your lab code. Yes. Uh, what's local-314? Ah. <laughs> in the United States, the trade unions will be separated in various geographic locations, and they'll be, uh, they'll be uh, uh, denoted by a number. So, for example, the, the, the electricians' union, the area in Philadelphia might be local number two, the, you know, local three, and it goes across the country. You're going to have local 7134 you know, at some point, just to identify your, your geographic area. So this, of course, is the mad scientist union, local 3.14, which, of course, is rounded pi. <laughs> <laughs> it's science! <laughs> Any other questions? Anything you want to know? I'm a bubbling fountain of information, <laughs> vomiting forth knowledge. Hello, what can I vomit you? Are you referring to the wrongest uh, call ever? Right. Yes, your reference is the, the longest continuous running furry convention in the world. It's older than Africon, and it's, it is the longest run. It's the convention that's been going without stopping for the longest time. It is also the best in the world. You get that from me. <laughs> <laughs> Question: is, is there anybody here for whom this is your first furry convention by chance? And you're a super sponsor. God, I love you. <laughs> Do not miss the Paul Pet Show. If, if you sleep through the rest of the convention, make sure you see the Paul Pet Show. Trust me. I have a question. Yeah. Was there any time you get you so drunk that you even want to get on stage? <laughs> I think it was BF10. I think. That was when they brought in the wine in the cake. <laughs> that was the year that somewhere around 1.30 in the morning, I forgot how to speak English. <laughs> and I thought it would be a good idea. I remember, I was sitting with Night Fox and Cheetah and Yerik. You might have been there too. I seem to remember. I don't think so. Okay, you're just trying to protect yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> they kept, they kept feeling, every time the glass was even close to not being full, they would make sure it stayed full. Somewhere in the area of 145. I thought it would be a good idea. One of those, those large beer glasses downstairs we have, the, the Rosa beer glasses. I thought it would be a good idea to mix equal parts Jägermeister, red wine, and absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered the next day that you, you only live once, but you can die many times. <laughs> I woke up dead. I was not breathing. I had no pulse. My skin was gray. I was starting to rot. And that next day was Uncle Kage's story hour. I was on stage, having had no solid food in me because there was no way it would remain. I don't really think my story hour was very good that year. <laughs> Um, I have not had absinthe, or Jägermeister, or red wine since. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I must be from New York. I have one minute left. Questions? Where would you like to go someday? Where would I like to go someday? Where would I like to go someday? I would like to give Uncle Kage a story hour at, at um, one of the Japanese furry conventions in Japan. Because no one will have an idea of what I'm saying. <laughs> but they will give me sake. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that raises the question, how big are the East Asian fur communities? And is there any interconnection? Because I don't know a single one. There, there are two main, major furry conventions in Japan. There's Kemokon, which is mainly a fursuit convention. And then there's... Uh, I, I cannot recall the name of the second one. That one is new, and it's, it's attempting to be more the Anthrocon style. 
more, not just pursuit, not just this, but there are various business and cultural differences that make it difficult to have an Anthrocon or Eurofern style convention over there. They're trying. This year at Anthrocon, we, we established the bridge. Uh, we invited Sardouan, an acrobat from Japan, over, and a large contingent, 13 or 14 people came from Japan, uh, including a, a wonderful uh, gentleman <coughs> who thankfully could communicate in Japanese <laughs> with my guest for me, because that was, that was a somewhat uncomfortable circumstance when this, this great acrobat I admired for so many years showed up in his limousine. And he got out, and I said, Mr. Sarjuan, I am so, so pleased to see you here. My name is Sam Conway. I'm your host. If there's anything you need, just call me. In the meantime, uh, if you would, would like to have a dinner or something, you know, I will certainly take you there. If there's anything you need, shall I have your bags taken to your room? <coughs> and he said, Okay. You eat. <laughs> Fortunately, I studied Japanese for exactly one semester in college, so I had to think back to my elementary Japanese. I I was able to ask him. Uh, did he have dinner? Was his flight comfortable? I told him that my pencil is yellow. <laughs> I asked him which way to Shibuya Station. <laughs> but it was, it was grand time. We had a number of Japanese folk there. They had a good time. They took back some ideas. I stole some ideas from them. So we're looking forward to a, a much more expanded collaboration between East and West in the future. Uh, this one question. Do you have thoughts about uh, I'm stopping to be chairman of Amsterdam? I wrote the corporate rules for Amsterdam. I wrote that the chairman may resign and his resignation becomes effective when the board of directors accepts his resignation. Every year, I have resigned. <laughs> Every year, the board of directors has rejected my resignation. I guess it's a compliment. <laughs> but it's sort of like not being allowed to die. <laughs> we would live for 400 years and just seek the peace of death and it won't be given to you. <laughs> no, I, I would not mind handing over an Amphicon to someone else, but the problem I run into is I need to find someone who is intelligent and capable enough to do the job, but stupid enough to take the job. <laughs> I have a lot of people who fall into one or the other category, but I haven't found someone who crosses the line. Like you. Like me. <laughs> That's it. The chairman of a furry convention is a person who is organized and intelligent, but in certain ways very naive. <laughs> Cheetah. Cheetah. <laughs> Do you notice how Cheetah looks on Monday? I have a beautiful picture. I have a picture of Cheetah and Night Fox sitting together. They're, they're, they're looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The funny point is that Cheetah actually had free time at this convention this time. He does? Yes. What's his secret? I don't know. <laughs> he walked around yesterday and I yes. you must tell me. <laughs> I have a, a picture of him taking pictures of other people. Without it even looking straight. So fucking boring. We'll talk with him later. I want to know what his secret is. <laughs>